as you know, our district mission and vision is all about students, student learning growth, preparing students to graduate future ready. And as you know, a big part of us being able to fulfill our mission and vision for our students is providing our students with the learning environments that they deserve. So that's what I really want to focus on today and share uh, information about today. So I want to start with our current situation. We are experiencing rapid growth as a district. We now have 27,830 students. And uh, as many of you know, we cover a geographic area of 76 square miles. We serve families and students in the cities of Kirkland, Redmond, and Sammamish, also unincorporated King County in a small slice of Bellevue. We have 52 schools, and for many, many years, we've been the sixth largest district in Washington State. We're now the fourth largest district in Washington State, and we grew from sixth largest to fourth largest in just one year. This slide shows you our enrollment growth over the past three years, so you can see how that growth has been continuing. And just since last year, we are up 1,114 students. That's 34 classrooms worth of students growth in just one year. This is a great chart because it shows you our historical enrollment and uh, the growth that we've been experiencing over the past several years. So this is back in 1998-99. And you can see that for many years, our enrollment was pretty flat and hovering around 24,000 students. And you can see what's been happening year to year for the past several years. So this year follows seven straight years of enrollment increases. And if you look at just the past five years, on average, we've grown 625 students a year, each year for the past five years. That's the size of a large elementary school's worth of students growth each and every year for the past five years. We know that the growth will continue. We just had kindergarten registration a couple of weeks ago. We're going to have about 2,200 kindergartners next year. By way of comparison, we graduated about 1,600 seniors last year. So we've been welcoming in and will continue to welcome in significantly larger classes of students than we've been graduating students. And we know that just five years from now, we'll be over 30,000 students in the district. We will be the third or potentially second largest district in the state in just the next couple of years. And if you look out farther to the 2029-2030 school year, we'll have over 32,000 students in the district. So that's great. The growth is wonderful. It's wonderful that we live in a community, in communities where people want to live and work and we've got great schools. People want to send their children to our schools. All of that is wonderful. The challenge is we don't have enough classroom space for all of our students. We've got overcrowded schools and we've got aging facilities that we need to address. So let me tell you a little bit about the challenge. By the beginning of next year, we'll have 168 portables in use across the district. That's 14% of our classroom capacity and the equivalent of seven elementary schools worth of classrooms. That's about 4,000 of our students in portables. In addition to the growth that we're experiencing, there's good news in that the state is starting to fund educational improvements like all day kindergarten for all of our students and reduce class size for grades kindergarten through third grade. However, while we're receiving funding to implement those programs, we don't receive any funding for the classrooms needed to actually house those programs. So that's just adding to our classroom challenge. As you know, we also have aging facilities across the district. We've got schools that don't meet our current educational standard, our current educational specifications. Uh, we know how important the learning environment is for our students in terms of lighting and acoustics and all of those things, in addition to the working environment for our staffs. This is a great slide that I want to spend just a couple minutes walking us through because it shows you that enrollment slide from a couple of slides ago. Together with some of the things we've done or attempted to do as a district over the past recent years to address some of our facility challenges. So this is back in 1998-99. We passed a bond measure. It funded what was called phase one modernization at that time and through that bond measure we up graded or replaced 11 of our schools across the system. We also added Rosa Parks Elementary into the system at that time from a previous bond measure. 
Then here in 2006, we passed a bond measure. It funded phase two modernization. We upgraded or replaced 11 more schools at that time, and we added Carson Elementary into the system. Then here in 2010, we attempted a bond measure uh, that did not pass. Bond measures require 60% voter approval to pass. Had that bond measure passed, we would have upgraded or replaced Juanita, uh, done additions at two of our high schools, and we would have built two new elementary schools that would be in the system today had that bond measure passed. But the bond measure didn't pass, so in 2011, we ran a six-year capital facility levy, and that levy did pass. Levies require 50% voter approval to pass. So through the 2011 six-year levy, we did the addition at Eastlake High School, the addition at Redmond High School, and we built Tesla STEM High School. And that gave us enough room at the high school level to shift to four-year high schools. So that's what we did here in 2012. We moved to four-year high schools, and that temporarily gave us some space at the elementary level because we now have K-5 elementaries instead of K-6 elementaries. Then, as most of you know, we attempted bond measures in 2014. The February bond measure garnered 58% voter approval, but it didn't get the 60% needed to pass. So when uh, that happened in 2014, we had to step back and uh, reassess and put together just a short-term plan to get us through the next couple of years. So that's what we did here in 2015. As you know, we added more portables into the system, about 38 portables. We did a district-wide boundary adjustment to shift students from their current schools to schools where there was room or where we were adding room because of the portables. Um, we're also doing a small addition at Redmond Elementary. And we've got schools like Evergreen Middle School and uh, Juanita High School having to do interior building modifications to create teacher planning spaces so we can use the classrooms every single period of every single day for students. So all of that was just a short-term kind of Band-Aid solution to get us through the next couple of years, but we really need a long-term solution, and the long-term solution is to build more schools. So I want to talk to you about the process that we completed beginning in 2014 to really reassess our plan. And we convened a representative group, and that representative group developed a strategy for us that will enable us to give all of our students the learning environments that they deserve. So we had a 63-member task force that included staff members and parents and community members. They convened beginning in December of 2014, and they spent nearly a year analyzing all of our facility needs as a district, really looking into our enrollment projections and needs, looking into the costs associated with building schools, and uh, they developed a set of recommendations for us. They conducted a significant amount of community engagement throughout their nearly year-long process. As I said, they developed a set of recommendations for us through the 2029-2030 school year, when we'll have over 32,000 students in the district. So they recommended a long-term strategy. And while the overall recommendation is to build more schools, there's much more to their recommendations, including ensuring that we're being very intentional with our planning, that uh, we're exploring creative options for space. I'll give you an example of one of those in just a moment. Um, that we, when we do build new schools or rebuild existing schools, that we implement cost-effective uh, design principles to help reduce costs. They also have recommendations for continued community involvement uh, with respect to our facility needs as a district, and also recommended backup plans if we're not able to build enough, fast enough, to meet the demands of our student enrollment. So once the committee completed their work, they presented their recommendations to our board. Our board unanimously accepted the committee's recommendations, and we then began developing a funding plan that will enable us to actually implement those recommendations. And we can fund the plan without raising the tax rate for our community. So I want to talk to you now about the funding plan. It's comprehensive, responsible, cost conscious, and fiscally disciplined in that it implements the task force recommendations. Uh, so we'll be able to address both our short-term needs and our long-term needs out through the 2029-2030 school year. 
and we'll be able to address the needs of all of our learning communities. The plan enables us to address our overcrowding challenges in some of our aging facilities. We'll be able to reduce our reliance on portables and implement both all day kindergarten and reduce class size for grades K through three over time. I mentioned uh, the cost effective design principles. So we will be implementing those specific design principles. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, when we look at Juanita High School, rebuilding Juanita High School, uh, we're looking at a three-story building for that. So stacking or you know, building multi-story buildings versus uh, building out in one-story kind of sprawling campuses, that's one of those cost-effective design principles recommended by the committee that we'll be implementing. Another is the use of proto parts. So what that means is when we, uh, for example, build an elementary school on one site, to the extent possible, we'll use that same design on multiple sites. So every site has different constraints in terms of sloping and wetlands and those kinds of things that you have to consider. But to the extent possible, we'll use the same design multiple times to keep design costs contained. So those are just a couple of examples. They also recommended uh, leveraging the use of existing facilities for long-term needs. So what that means is that when we do need to rebuild an aging school, uh, we're gonna build it larger so it can accommodate more students. So for Juanita High School, for example, it will be able to accommodate 500 more students than it can today once we rebuild and enlarge it. The plan is fiscally disciplined in that it doesn't increase the tax rate. So because we're paying off past bonds and that 2011 six-year capital facility levy, it gives us some capacity to essentially seek replacement funding for, from the community and keep the tax rate level. Our current tax rate is $3.30 per thousand of assessed value. That includes both levies and bonds. So the plan involves a bond in April 2016 and the total projects, which I'll get to in just a moment, total $429 million. However, if we can pass a bond measure, we'll receive state construction funding assistance in the amount of $21 million from the state and we receive what are called developer impact fees. So when developers build a new neighborhood, they're required to pay a school impact fee to the city. The city then pays that fee to us. And that fee is designed to pay for a portion of the development that comes out of the new development. So we'll receive 10 million in school impact fees. So after receiving those funds, it actually brings the dollar amount needed for the bond down to $398 million. And again, we won't increase the tax rate, we'll maintain the 2015 tax rate. Since this is a long-term plan, it also involves subsequent bond measures in 2018, 2022, and 2026 to fund the longer-term needs. These bond measures won't increase the tax rate either. So the way we've structured the funding over time, we'll be able to maintain that steady 2015 rate for our communities over the long haul. And this plan puts our bonds and levies on the same four-year cycle. So every four years, we have to go out to our community to seek replacement levy funding. Levies fund learning. Uh, levies fund staff salaries. Levies fund technology. Levies fund professional learning. All of the things that the state doesn't fund, uh, local levies fund. So you can think about it as levies fund learning. And we go out to our community to seek that levy support every four years. That's how it works. This plan puts our bonds, bonds fund buildings, on that same four-year cycle. So we'll be going out once every four years to our community to seek the support for both learning and buildings. This is hard to read on this slide, but we do have this information on a handout that you'll get after this. Um, this shows the planned projects, both on the April 2016 bond and on the subsequent bond measures. I just wanna highlight the projects that are on the 2016 bond, the April bond coming up. We're gonna rebuild and enlarge Juanita High School, rebuild and enlarge Kirk Elementary, rebuild and enlarge Mead Elementary, build a new middle school in the Redmond Learning Community on Redmond Ridge on property that the district owns, build two new elementary schools in the Redmond Learning Community, one on Redmond Ridge, one in North Redmond, both on property that the district owns, uh, this is one of those creative options that the task force recommended. It says refurbish old Redmond schoolhouse for preschool. So when we built the new Redmond Elementary a number of years ago, we received state construction funding assistance to help pay for that project. 
and we left the old Redmond Schoolhouse intact. It's a historical building and it is currently being leased to the city of Redmond and used as a community center. So because we receive state construction funding assistance for uh, the construction of Redmond Elementary, uh, the rules say you can't go back now years later if the original building's still intact and try to use that building for K-12 purposes. Uh, if we were to do that, uh, we would be ineligible to collect state construction funding assistance for 10 years in the future. That would be about an $80 million decision. It would not be a wise fiscal decision. Uh, so while we won't be going back to try to use it for K-12 purposes, the rules say you can use it for non-K-12 purposes, including preschool. So as you know, we have a number of our elementary schools that have preschools on site. Uh, we serve Head Start students, Ready Start students, special education students. And so what this plan allows us to do is to take some of those preschool classrooms and uh, bring them to a preschool center at the old Redmond Schoolhouse and that frees up the classroom space at the neighboring elementary for K-5 purposes. Finally, uh, we're going to replace the old uh, portables out at Explorer with a new modular setup so similar to what we've done at some of our other choice schools. And then we have some dollars uh, for implementing uh, projects to comply with Title IX and ADA. So all total $398 million, no tax rate increase. And as we look forward into the future with the subsequent bond measures, the dollar amounts of the bonds actually go down. So in 2018, we're looking at a $288 million bond down to $278 million in 2022, down to $207 million in 2026, all with no tax rate increase. So just to summarize, our board has unanimously voted to place a bond measure on the ballot in April, this coming April. The longer term plan involves subsequent bond measures in 18, 22, and 2026 to fund the longer term needs in the district. The bond measures won't increase the tax rate for our communities. Uh, through each bond measure, we'll be able to increase classroom space, reduce reliance on portables, and address some of our aging facilities. And we'll be implementing all of the cost effective design principles recommended by the Long Term Facility Planning Task Force. Election Day is April 26th. Please vote and make your voice heard.